the you're going so deep into the work and you're gaining so much wisdom in yourself and understanding of your own life and your life path that it's it's almost like you're you know you're say Janine 2.0 you're going to be like Janine 4.0 when you leave and so what psilocybin is doing it's like let's just get rid of that thought and why don't we just go this way and we just like reroutes neural new neural pathways and so then you have this opportunity to almost like reprogram the way that you're thinking. Mm-hmm. So that's where a lot of my focus goes into. It's like, it's one thing to go through a psilocybin experience, but I really like to focus on like, okay, we have these new pathways. Like, how do you want to show up in your life? How do you want to feel? So let's really work on that. Maybe not going back to doing the same routines you were doing before. Let's try different ones. Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Tara Portelli. She's a paramedic turned psilocybin retreat facilitator and so much more. Gosh, if you've ever wondered if psilocybin so they come from mushrooms specific ones could be beneficial for you this is the podcast to listen to now here's the thing they've got a bad rap because we think about tripping we think about you know having bad trips you've seen all the stories maybe you've heard them from college or high school or whatever it may be but the point is is there's a lot of research being done worldwide on psilocybins and their benefit for helping folks move through mental health issues, moving through self-sabotaging blocks, anything that's keeping you from being your best self or achieving what you want to. If you find that you're just hanging up on things, this is a place to look. Now, have I been on a psilocybin retreat before? No. Have I done a journey, meaning a, a day where you actually take the, the mushrooms in and work through some things? No. I've done microdosing and felt like, okay, something shifted gently, but I have not tried this. So I dive in with Tara and ask her all kinds of questions. So like I said before, if you're wondering if a guided psilocybin retreat may be for you, something to help you move through anxiety, depression, self-sabotage, whatever it may be, this podcast is a good one because I just ask her all the questions that I get and what I've been wondering about. So let's introduce you to Tara Portelli. Tara Portelli, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Man, just before we hit record, I am like so excited to talk to you because I've been looking for someone that has a little bit of a West Coast connection to help folks with psilocybin therapy and learning now that you're doing some some retreats in Canada in the summer months um, up in British Columbia. That makes me so happy to hear. But of course, we'll we'll talk about that. We'll talk about your Mexico retreats near Tulum as well, because who doesn't want to take a break to Tulum in the middle of rainy season in the Pacific Northwest? Sign me up. <laughs> so with psilocybin, of course, the first and foremost thing that people always tend to ask me about is like, okay, if I'm going to do a psilocybin retreat or therapy, am I going to be tripping the whole time? And this is something that I want to set the theme as we're going to talk about that. We want to get into that today and and really explain to folks what's happening with the psilocybins and how they can help with conditions like PTSD, just working through a rough time in life, whatever it may be. So you have quite a story. And I would love for you to share your story with us because I think for women, 35 plus, we tend to get to a point where life just doesn't like we're ready to leave one life and we're like ready to go to the next as the hormones shift we're ready to train like just just transform so i would love to hear your story to kind of help folks really understand how psilocybin found you how you found it and how it helped yeah um so i was a paramedic for nine years and during my career i struggled myself with mental health Um, Not only that, I struggled in relationships because I always believed, as Walt Disney painted this picture for us, that I was meant to meet my Prince Charming. And I think a lot of us really are looking for that and we don't find it, but we also don't know that 
that it's not perfect and that relationships are work and they can be challenging. And if we're not doing our own work, we're going to keep the wrong people around. And so I went through this relationship career leading up to my career as a paramedic, um, relationship after relationship, um, struggled in that area. And then I ended up working as a paramedic and really being called to that field because I really knew I wanted to help people in some way. I grew up with a sister who had bipolar disorder, a father who suffered from depression. So mental health um, struggles were in my family already, and I really wanted to find a solution. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I'll go into, you know, working as a paramedic and see, see how I like that job. So nine years later, I, um, I went through, like I said, many struggles of my own. And went through therapy and did all the traditional routes, um, never used any pharmaceuticals, but just always trying to talk through what I was experiencing. Um, I had PTSD, depression, and anxiety during my career. And in addition to that, you like, it was also life stress, you know, so it was kind of like everything piling up on top of each other. And I was just so unhappy. I felt so unfulfilled in my relationship and my career. And I finally exited the career and I ended up working in a holistic mental health and addiction treatment center. And that was very eye opening for me. It kind of showed me that there are other options outside of pharmaceuticals that can help and benefit our mental wellness. And I was watching people coming in really distraught with their mental health and leaving in a totally different um, state of mind. And like what we were using was neurofeedback. We were using diet, exercise, routine, yoga, meditation, like you name it, any holistic practice we were implementing and it was profound for people. And so this really opened up my eyes to the idea of like, maybe I could get into a career in mental health, but maybe it's, just, it's this route. So I worked with them until they went bankrupt. Unfortunately, it was a private facility. And then, um, and then after going through a, a divorce and losing my dog of 10 years and my whole life crumbling in front of me, I ended up going on this self-healing journey. I felt really called to go to Tulum, Mexico. So I went on this journey and I showed up there by myself, never really traveled alone. So this was a first for me. And I kind of let my journey unfold. I just knew where I was going to stay and just kind of let my trip unfold. And I would just meet the right people and be like, you need to go here. You need to do this. And then I kind of just followed it until I landed on the beach um, taking photos of a kite surfer and this kite surfer was doing these amazing tricks. And I was like, these are amazing photos. I have to get this person these photos. So I sat down on the beach and sure enough, I like kind of put it out there. Like I have to get these to this person. And this person swooped in and we exchanged emails because I wanted to give him photos. And I got an email from him and he was like, you and I were meant to meet. He's like, um, you're the nude mushroom because at the time during my paramedic career, I was also studying holistic nutrition. Um, and I had started a health and wellness blog called the nude mushroom. This was pre psychedelics. So it was almost like intuitive. And so he's like, we were meant to meet, um, psilocybin saved my life. And so we met up and sure enough, he had suffered with cluster headaches or suicide headaches. And it was the only thing in 25 years that he was able to find to help him. So he had been helping people all around the world and he gifted me with some mushrooms and said, here you go, like, go do these. And I was just like, well, I'm in Mexico alone. Like, I'm going to do these mushrooms. This seems crazy to me. And so I consciously like planned to go to this beach. And I was like, if I don't feel comfortable there, I'm not going to do them. I contacted a friend who wouldn't talk me out of it. And I took myself through this journey, knowing that he didn't give me a large dose. It was like, um, like the, on the lower end of therapeutic and had the most profound and transformational healing journey of my entire life. It changed everything for me. And one of the most profound insights that I gained was around, um, the fact that I had been searching for love outside of myself, but in fact, I always just needed to love me first. Mm -hmm. And by loving myself, it's changed everything for me because 
you know, we all, we're looking outside and we're like, I need this person in my life. But the reality is, is that once you nurture that self-love, that everything else kind of just feels better and more at peace. So that was kind of my journey to psilocybin. And I just looked for a path to work with it because I knew that this was going to be a really profound healing for anybody who's struggling and conventional treatments haven't been effective. Oh, wow. It's <laughs> it's so important, right? The self-love yeah. thing. And I think a lot of us underestimate how much we we don't have self-love. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I know my myself included have just kind of went through a journey of that too and, and been like, oh my God, I'm so mean to myself. You know, there's so much there. Now, of course, you can't leave the sisters hanging here. Like what happened with the guy? <laughs> Which the beach guy? The no. Mexican what happened with the, the kite border? What happened? Oh, yeah. N- you know what? Nothing ever came of it. We've become friends. He's actually, he's kind of in the background of my business. So he he safely gets me um, a good supply for my retreats and, and that kind of thing. So, so there's no roaming. <laughs> it's not, it's not a happy ending there, but yeah. <laughs> I gotta ask, you know, you left it open there. So yeah, I, I figured we, we better ask where, where that went. Well, and I mean, and that's the important thing. So you mentioned like, he's your supplier. And, and, and that's one of the things like, you know, a lot of folks, when they're thinking like, okay, so seven, it's not regulated. The FDA doesn't regulate it, at least, you know, mm-hmm. in the American society, we're going to think that. And, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of controversy on what, what the FDA does and doesn't do. So I'm not going to go there, but it's more like, how do we know that someone that's supplying psilocybin to you, like, how, what are we looking for to ensure ourselves that we're getting a good quality supply? And like, say someone's looking to go to a th- retreat center like yours, how would they know that they're they're really going to a place that's legit? Because I think there there's a lot of, you know, fear mm-hmm. around that. Yeah. And, and honestly, rightfully so, because there is a lot of, you know, there is a lot of people out there that are doing it for the wrong reasons, mm-hmm. you know, and they're not creating safe spaces. Um, so I would say to look for, first of all, um, I would get on, a, ask for a video call with the facilitator, kind of connect with them. And then obviously your intuition is going to, I mean, we're women. So like our intuition is always speaking to us, but also see how they're questioning you because if they're not asking questions like, you know, are you on SSRIs, which are antidepressants, or have you ever had a state of psychosis? Do you have bipolar disorder, schizophrenia? Those are all contraindications. So okay. somebody that's really knowledgeable that you should be able to trust would would almost be assessing you as if it was a clinical um, clinical setting and kind of vet, like making sure that you are the right fit for it. So right there, you're going to know that that person's in it for the right reasons and that they have the right intentions. Um, and then as far as choosing, I guess, and I would say when you're like, if you're looking for a retreat and you are looking for a reputable place, so maybe looking for reviews online as well is really important and just making sure that other people are having good experiences. Um and that kind of will speak to the quality of the medicine. Mm-hmm. And then if you're looking for medicines outside of that, I mean, it's really difficult. There is some really good companies online and they do ship to the U S um, that you can trust. Cause there is sometimes people just growing them in their garage, you know? So you, you just, you just never know. And you do want to make sure that it is a reputable company that you're using. Um, luckily here in Canada, in Victoria, Vancouver, Toronto, we actually have dispensaries. Now it's, it's still like a gray area. They are overseen by like, naturopaths. Um, but the, so then, you know, like when they are overseen by a naturopath that the medicine would be good and that they would be sourcing it from the right places. So usually like just like options like that would be would be ones that you could trust. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yes. Naturopaths are definitely be very picky on yes. where things are grown. We probably went to the location. We probably, you know, <laughs> show me all the details. Thanks for sharing that, because I think for a lot of people, you know, this is a the the 60s and 70s and let's say college experiences you know we all have ideas of what psilocybin's 
you know, are like, but we think more of the tripping department, but we don't necessarily think about how we can tap in to our inner selves. And like you were mentioning, you know, coming to the conclusion that, oh my gosh, I just need more self-love, you know, I need to work on that. So can you explain a little bit for us what exactly is opening up in the mind? What what portals are we opening? How is this how is this working when we take psilocybin? What's what's it doing to the body, and what kind of things might one expect? Yeah, so psilocybin works on the same receptors as an antidepressant, um, and so what it's doing is actually at your during the experience, you're actually accessing parts of the brain that you don't typically access. So you're going to experience things like heightened senses. Um, sometimes you have um, visuals. Sometimes you have audible. Um, you can hear things. Um, sometimes you don't have any of that. Sometimes it's just sensations and feelings in the body. And, and just really what it's doing is whatever emotions that you've been suppressing, it's going to bring them to the surface. Um, and that's a good thing because energy, because emotions are energy and we suppress them and they get stored in the body. But the only way that we can release them is by transmuting them, right? Because energy cannot be created or destroyed. It has to be transferred. So um, if we're suppressing all our emotions, like most women do, because they're like these warriors and like, you know, you're muscling through your life, you know, it's time for you to sit with those emotions and just let them move through you. Because once you release them, you just feel liberated. So it helps with that piece. Um, in addition to that, what it actually is doing in the brain is it's rerouting neural pathways. So um, so when we have thoughts, they're usually the same thoughts over and over. Like we kind of get in these habits of thinking and, and there are these, these neurons that fire in the same pattern over and over again. When we go to therapy, we're trying to override those thoughts with new thoughts, but it's really difficult. It's like unlearning a behavior. And so what psilocybin is doing, it's like, let's just get rid of that thought. And why don't we just go this way? And we just like reroutes neural, new neural pathways. And so then you have this opportunity to almost like reprogram the way that you're thinking. Mm -hmm. So that's where a lot of my focus goes into. It's like, it's one thing to go through a psilocybin experience, but I really like to focus on like, okay, we have these new pathways. Like, how do you want to show up in your life? How do you want to feel? So let's really work on that. Maybe not going back to doing the same routines you were doing before. Let's try different ones. Why don't we implement that meditation practice you really enjoyed in retreat? You know, those types of things. Um, and then some of the studies that they're doing with microdosing, which is, uh, just small doses, you don't actually get the psychedelic experience. Um, it's actually showing that it's growing new neurons in mice. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. And so they haven't done it on humans just yet, but hopefully it's translating and that's what's happening for us as well. So maybe we're getting smarter when we're microdosing. <laughs> well, I mean, I certainly have had lots of patients who've tried that, right? I myself have also done that just to see what would happen. And right. what I found is like, if you put an intention towards it, right? And you really are working on on your own health and your thought process, absolutely seems like it, it amplifies things. Um, mm -hmm. For a lot of people that don't do, that do the microdosing, but don't put an intention with it, I feel like it's sometimes they're like, it does nothing. And it's like, well, you're not, you haven't put the energy forth for the body mm -hmm. to bring that forward. Have you seen that too? Yeah, I've heard that from people, but then it's funny because I'll be like, well, do you still feel that anxiety you were feeling before? No. Do you still feel like, you know, do you feel calmer than you were before? Yeah. Okay. Well then it's working, you know, cause those are side effects of it. Also more clarity, more, um, access to creativity. Mm -hmm. Those are also things that are happening for you. Which I mean, awesome stuff, right? Who doesn't want that? And, and I think for a lot of folks too, that are listening this isn't, we're not tripping when we're microdosing. Yeah. Like it's, it, we're not seeing visions, you know, honestly, it's subtle. I, I felt like it was very subtle. Now, in terms of the larger doses, this is where I have not had experience and, and, and really wanted to find a place that I could go on a retreat, kind of do all the work around it. And I'm super curious, how do your retreats work? What do you guys do with folks? I mean, I saw online, I, I was like super relaxed watching your video online going like, 
sign me up right now. <laughs> I'm good. So, so tell us a little bit more. Yeah. So the whole intention of the retreat setting for psilocybin therapy is to create a container. And when we can create a container, what we can do is we can prepare you beforehand, energetically speaking, because obviously we're, we are energy. And so we have to open up those energy channels to be able to really gain the insights and the, and the connection with the medicine. So, so it's kind of like this gradual experience. So every single day we're doing meditation and in meditation, we're doing shadow work. And so for your listeners, if they don't know what shadow work is, it's just basically, you know, kind of exploring the aspects of the self that we do not accept. So we all have them. We have these parts of ourselves that we don't accept, but we also, we, we have parts of ourselves we love, parts of ourselves we don't accept. So it's kind of embracing the whole the whole of us and loving that entirety in the entirety. So that seems to be really profound for people because a lot of people never really go there. They're too afraid to see that part of themselves. But when you can bring it in and you can see that it has gifts that it has like, you know, that it does bring good things to your life and that you should just embrace it, then that really does help people to kind of get to that place of self-love. So that's kind of how we structure the retreat. And then in, inside, before we go into ceremony with the medicine, which we'll do too within the retreat, um, we'll do some sound healing. So mm -hmm. again, we're working on the vibration with our bodies and changing the energy. And it's almost like experiencing like a symphony before you go into the medicine, which is really amazing. Um, we use massage therapy, so touch therapy. And then um, we have access when we're in Mexico to something called a Temescal. So for those of people that don't know, it's an indigenous sweat lodge. And it's really a beautiful ceremony to experience because they're still so connected to their roots and their culture. And they're really bringing in the wisdom, the seeds of this um, indigenous wisdom to the ceremony. And what I find for people is... It is a challenge because you're in a sweat lodge and obviously you, you just do what you can do. Like there's no, we're not forcing you to do it. It's like all part of the experience. But when people can go through that experience, they feel so empowered in themselves. They're like, I can do this medicine journey thing. It's like easy. Like if I can be in that sweat lodge, I can do this and no problem. But also what that's doing is it's detoxifying the body. Um, it's helping with like, I mean, the medicine man that we work with, he's helping like cleanse you and your energy field and all of the things that they believe. And so it's just really preparing you for the experience. So, yeah. So, and then afterwards, obviously we're doing integration, which is probably one of the most important parts of a psilocybin experience, because just like anything, psilocybin is a tool. So it gives us the ability to maybe see things in ourselves that we wouldn't see otherwise, or like understand things about our life. But then when we go into the integration process, we're just kind of like taking that information and seeing how does that apply to my life? What am I going to do with that information? How am I going to apply and move forward and make change? And so, yeah, so that's what a retreat looks like. Wow. You've got a lot of great components. I mean, I, I love that you've got the integration because I, I find that a lot of folks will go and and they don't get the integration. It's just the ceremony and it's like, all right, this happened. Okay, bye. I mean, yeah. that's that's kind of what what seems to be happening, at least in my local area in the different locations that I've heard about. Now, I don't want any disrespect anyone that's doing more than that. I just don't know. Um, but but that's kind of what I've seen and and I find it so vitally important because after all, you you're spending the money to come down and and have a transformation. Yes, absolutely. And and so I see this often and a lot of people will come to me after they've done other medicine journeys or maybe other medicines and it's like they're not integrating properly. So what's happening is it just becomes like another substance you're using to seek something, you know, like when we're using alcohol or, or drugs, it's, it just becomes this like, well, this person had this experience. Like I want to feel better. Like I want to feel better too. But when you're not doing the integration work, it's, it's just going to be like this ongoing cycle of, of seeking. And so when, when you do do it in a retreat setting, like, like, like ours or whatever, not to come to ours, but you know, <laughs> um, it's the, you're going so deep into the work 
and you're gaining so much wisdom in yourself and understanding of your own life and your life path that it's, it's almost like you're, you know, you're say Janine 2.0, you're going to be like Janine 4.0 when you leave. And I've kept in touch with many of our clients and because we are going so deep. And also I should mention that these are really intimate setting. So we usually max out at the most at six people, but typically it's two to four. So we really have the opportunity to really go deep into the work. And then, and then, then they have a plan going home and then there's ongoing support as well afterwards. And so with that, I find that people like will basically transform and then maintain it because mm-hmm. they now have the tools that they need in order to do the proper integration when they go home and also the support if they need it. So, yeah. That's huge. That's huge. Hey, Hell Junkies, struggling with sleep? As a former insomniac, I can relate. Devin Burke is a pal of mine. He has the Sleep Science Academy. He's been on my podcast twice, and we've talked a lot about how to work on sleep naturally, without supplements, without medications. Devin's program really does work with you to help you understand what is going on in your brain and body when it comes to sleep. And as a listener of the Health Fix podcast, he's given us a code for 10% off of his program, DRJ10. So if you're interested, use that. I highly recommend his program. So let's get back to the podcast. And two to four people, I mean, that's very, very intimate. I'm like thinking like, ha, huh, husband and wife, you know, a, a yeah. small group. Do you get couples coming down often? A lot of couples. Yeah. A lot of couples want to come and do this work and they like the idea of the smaller setting. Um, uh, yeah. And also, I just want to mention like part of the reason and I'm not knocking any group ceremonies because actually that's how the indigenous use it. Right. But um, for myself, like going into group medicines, I found that it was too much energy, too many yeah. people. Um, I couldn't focus in on myself. And so I thought, well, I would rather work with smaller groups. And I and I find that it does become a bit of like a niche in a sense, because you do get the people that are either really struggling with mental health or get the people that, you know, they just don't want to be in a group setting and they want a small, intimate space and they want to feel safe and you know, and sometimes people aren't super extroverted as well. So it can just be a lot on top of trying to heal when you're trying to also like socialize. So, yeah. You brought up something incredibly important that I've seen with my own personal self. Like I'm, I think I'm like somewhere between introvert and extroverted. I kind of like float on both departments, but when there's a lot of people in a setting, I feel I'm very empathetic. So I feel all the different things, right? And I want to make sure what I'm feeling is my stuff, not someone else's stuff. Absolutely. And, and I think that's something to talk about in terms of of energy in general. Because a lot of people might be thinking like, okay, a group session obviously going to be cheaper, right? There's mm-hmm. going to be, I mean, I've heard of sessions where there's like a hundred people in these rooms in some cases. Is that what you've seen too? I haven't personally been to those ceremonies. Like I think the most I've been to is probably 30 people, but still it was, it was, it felt like a lot. And my experience in that setting was not a positive experience, but again, that's my personal experience, but it's also how we ended up doing like the smaller groups. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I I think it's something for a lot of folks to think about that other people's energy affects us. And one of the things you said on your, I think it was in your video on your website is that we have good energy here. We're maintaining good energy because I have, you know, I'm an acupuncturist, right? So I know if my energy is off and I'm trying to work on people, it doesn't go well. I have to ground. I have to keep working on my own self. And part of what had me actually, I moved away from my practice and and did a lot of online. I I do kind of go back and forth right now and not as much acupuncture because I couldn't get my energy right to feel good about helping, you know, on a daily basis. Wow. That's so interesting. Yeah. Just that you, you need to almost ground yourself because you are kind of this conduit to like the energy, right? Like to your, what do you call them? The acupuncture needles. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. And so at the same time, I mean, you know, not a lot of other folks don't think about how their particular jobs, you know, what they're 
you know, whether it's work, whether it's their family, whatever, how the other energy does does impact them. And sometimes I think that even using plant medicine can help incredibly to to move things through. And in, in particular, obviously, I don't want to confuse guys because um, I just said plant medicine and that can mean a whole lot of different things. And so I don't want to confuse the the audience. Um, Silosevens are different, right, than, than, than com- combo. And uh, I'm going to get that one wrong. I'm the worst yeah. with words. Words. <laughs> it's okay. Mean words. Um, well, yeah, you had it right. <laughs> yeah. All of those types of things and ayahuasca and whatnot. And so I want folks to understand that like this is mushroom um, extract here. We're talking mushrooms. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess where I'm going with this is that it's important for folks to be thinking about their energy. It's important to to think about when you want to make change, how a supportive environment can be all make all the difference. Absolutely. Now, it sounds like you also, all of your staff, you guys are really dialed in on keeping yourselves in chag, working on energy too. What's, what are some of your like personal practices? I'm curious, just, just to kind of share with other folks, like, what do you, what do you do to help keep your energy in check? Obviously, Silas Evans, but what else, what else are you doing? Yeah. So I always carve out space for myself every day, um, to either, well, most of the mornings, I meditate and I kind of have my own little practice and I create a little ceremony for myself and actually use that throughout my day. So every day for me, I create ceremony and I do put intention into everything I do. And I find that really keeps me present and really keeps me grounded. Um, And so, and also what I'll do is like when I feel sad or when I feel anger, like I actually will take time to feel those emotions. I'll journal about them. I'll allow them to move through me. I know that like, you know, sometimes people will trigger us and it will cause this flood of emotions. And I know that those people are just the messengers and that this is probably deep stuff that needs to come up. And so I just, I'm really conscious and aware of the fact that I need to do my own healing work as well. And so, and if I needed a therapist, I would seek a therapist. You know, I use a lot of intuitive healers, um, massage therapy, sound healing for myself. Every single thing that we've implemented into the retreat is what I use for myself to heal from my experiences in my life. And they all helped me in some on some level. Um, the sweat lodge especially for me was really profound. And so I use that when I'm in Mexico on a weekly basis. Oh, so wow. Yeah. So I use it like as a regular practice and being part of the ceremony is really important um, for, for my personal growth and expansion. So, yeah. So I think when we intentionally schedule ourselves into our day, like we can really help ourselves stay grounded and just becoming more self-aware because like you said, like when you're around a lot of people all the time and you're picking up different energies and people's moods are shifting and you just don't know who you are there in that space, you almost have to go into like a bubble and recalibrate your own energy and be like, okay, this is mine. That was theirs. You know, sometimes we can't, we can't distinguish what's, what's ours and what's others. So, so that's kind of how I've been doing my work anyways. Very cool. Very cool. I love the sound bass. I love sound. Um, mm-hmm. my husband always thought that I didn't like music, but I told him it's not that I just don't like the lyrics, right? I like the background, mm-hmm. you know, and, and literally the sound baths are so cool. Um, I have a weird question cause I didn't see it on your website, but do you guys ever do the ones where that, like, I see the people on Instagram laying on the mats in the water and they're floating there with sound baths. Oh, cool. I've um, never actually seen, like actually experienced that. We haven't done those, but I think that would be really neat. Because you're kind of implementing water as well, which is like one of the elements. So I think it could be really awesome. It, I'm so drawn to it. Every time I see it on on Instagram, I'm like, oh, I want to do that. That looks just oh amazing. Um, that being said, I, you know, back to the sweat lodges for a minute, because a lot of people will ask me about sweat lodges. I've never done one. I don't even know how long you're in there. All I've heard is that it's like hot yoga. You can't leave, um, which for me makes me a little stressed out. Because okay. I like to, you know, there's there's always that like I like to leave if if I get overwhelmed. Is what's it like? Like give it give us a little like how long are you guys in there? Like how hot does it actually get? <laughs> like are you know? And it sounds like there's not that many people because me I'm imagining lots of people in a lodge sweaty next to me. That doesn't sound like fun. 
Um, yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> give us the scoop on what's going on in there. Cause I've, I've never done one and I have no idea. So, I mean, obviously everyone, every ceremony is different. Um, some do fill them quite tight with lots of people. The ones that I use, um, they're usually two and a half hours um, in total, like the total time between the ceremony outside of the space and then inside there's four doors. Um, so the idea of the sweat lodge is, at least in um, the Mexica tradition, which is in Mexico, is that it's um, it's the mother's womb. So you're going to be rebirthed. And so they use volcanic rock, they steam it, and then they use herbs bur and burnt water. And so it's almost more like a steam than it would be like a, a dry sauna. So it feels like a steam. So they're putting these hot rocks, there's like chanting and music, and they're sharing their wisdom in the sweat lodge. It is dark. Um, but there's four doors and usually they're about 20 minute intervals and they open up the doors. They let all the heat out. And then you do have the opportunity to leave if you feel called, but obviously they recommend you stay in because when you leave, then you have to climatize your body back to the heat. But when you lay down on the floor, it's cement, so it's cooler. So there's always ways and, you know, just regulating your breathing and things that we don't typically do on a regular basis. Like you're just, you're forced to right in those moments. Um, and it's also overcoming, over, overcoming your fears, you know, so a lot of that is what comes up for you. So it can be a really spiritual practice as well, because it's like, I don't think I can do this. And then you, you're not, you know, you, you just, you have to work your, yourself through it. Um, and, and they say it can get up to, I believe 120 degrees is the maximum, but because it's a sweat lodge and a steam, it's like the steam rises. So then it's cooler and like, it's always moving. So it's always changing the temperature. Um, yeah. And then obviously like, depending on the temperature outside, it like can vary and, and how your body is that day. Like, are you hydrated? Did you eat too much? I think I brought my mom to one a couple of years ago and she wanted to go to the beach and have a pizza and a, and a glass of wine and comes to the sweat lodge and I was like did you prepare and she's like oh yeah I just had some pizza and wine I'm like okay great and so she comes in and she struggles right because like she wasn't prepared properly for it and so after the first door she left you know <laughs> so so it's 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 like anything like setting intention and just why are you here what do you want to get out of this experience? Like, what is, why are you, what do you want to heal inside of yourself? How do you want to feel when you leave? And so it's really, it, it becomes a practice of ceremony in itself, like just setting that intention. So huge. Gosh, I yeah. can't imagine having pizza and wine before going somewhere hot. <laughs> I know. Mm. Yeah. She was like struggling. <laughs> I was like, I told you. <laughs> You don't listen. <laughs> oh, you know, family's tough. Family's tough. Yeah. I'm I'm hoping that people do listen when they when they spend all the money to come down. Um, one other thing that I'm I'm asked quite frequently is what is you know we've got the psilocybin. How do you take them in in a ceremony? Is it tincture? I mean, a lot of people are going to think about like chocolates. They're going to think about are we chewing mushrooms? They're going to think you know capsule. What what what's the format? I'm I'm curious because I don't even know. Yeah, I guess every, but every facilitator does it differently. Um, the way that we do it is in a tea. Mm -hmm. So the reason being is that when you, when you eat the mushroom, say in a chocolate or on its own, um, it takes a long time because it doesn't actually become active until it hits the, until it hits the intestine and starts to break down. And so what we do is we'll use a tea and we, we do have like a very ceremonial experience that we'll go through. And then, and then in the tea, what's happening to the mushroom is it's breaking down the cell wall. So once you take it, now it's going to become active a lot quicker. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so that's typically how we do it. So we do a tea ceremony. Um, and within one ceremony, you also have the opportunity to increase your dose three times. So we really like to feel like how you're receiving the medicine because everybody's so different. You know, some, some people might, might be really really easy to go into a medicine journey and some people might struggle a little more. So, yeah. Oh, wow. So three times to increase dose. Now, of course, I'm going to, I'm, my brain's always like, okay, tea, okay, mushrooms, 
Is it, do you change the flavor? Like, do you have something for flavoring to, or is it tasting like mushrooms? Just, just out of curiosity. Yeah. So, so we're using whole mushrooms, the whole dried mushrooms. Um, so something we've recently started doing is bringing in um, the spirits of like different plants. So, so like, again, like learning from, from the Mexican culture, they believe that every plant has a spirit. And so we'll bring in like rose. So I will use rose petals in the tea and that's the thorn. So it's protection. And then we'll use um, the spirit of chamomile and that's to calm you. So you don't, cause a lot of people don't know what to expect and they feel anxious and it's just very calming. Um, so you use that. And sometimes we we'll use ginger as well. So just to bring that in, just settle your stomach if you start to feel any discomfort, but typically that's kind of how the tea is. So you'll get those, those flavors and, and the mush mushrooms are earthy. So, you know, they're not, they're not the best tasting, but they're not the worst either. So, yeah. Well, it's not like you're entering Starbucks, right? We're not looking yeah. for that experience. But at the same time, I do like, you know, to to share with folks like what what is it like? I love I love talking about herbs and their in their spirits. Like a lot of people in my practice that come up weirdo and I'm like, well, yeah. well, what are you? OK, well, this plant goes really well with that. Um <laughs> It's fun. It's fun, especially right. within the Mexican indigenous culture. I lived in Mexico for a year and had such a fabulous time learning from a lot of the Bruja Blancas just teaching me about what the herb herbs are all about. So I, you know, I think some of the other questions that I get and and thank you for letting me like just pick your your brain oh, yeah. on all the things because <laughs> I, I think another big question that I get from a lot of folks is like, OK, we got the tea. You mentioned settling the stomach. A lot of people will equate a trip to possibly feeling sick. Okay. How common is it in this case? Because I know ayahuasca is very connected to vomiting and purging. Does Is the purge more an energetic purge that you've seen? Uh, yeah, I would say more energetic. Um, it's very rare. Uh, there, actually, sorry, I've actually never seen anybody physically purge. Um, there's There might be a mo like a little stage of feeling some queasiness in your stomach but typically it goes away the only time it doesn't is when you're resisting or like you said like there is some energy that needs to really move from there yeah but it's it would be the most mild on your stomach definitely not what ayahuasca does to you or peyote or any of those like really strong psychedelics yeah good to know good to know and then mm -hmm. while you've got the active you know psilocybin's in your in your system what are, what do you have people doing in that time are we talking are we meditating are we what what are we doing in the actual time frame well because you like to talk about plant spirits <laughs> <laughs> um we let the mushroom do its work the spirits of the mushroom so we've you know once we've done the ceremony you're into the medicine we are doing some breath work to kind of um, accelerate the experience and get you into like this really focused state of mind um, and then you go you have a space um, we keep people separate so so many ceremonies you're all together yeah. again we're keeping you very separate from each other so that you can have your own independent experience without worrying about you know, oh, is that person going to see me crying or like, I don't want to be like yelling or, you know, whatever you need to do to express your emotion, you don't need to worry because you're going to be on your own. And so then we put uh, a headset with a curated playlist, which is a lot of the ambient music that you're talking about, mostly instrumentals, no lyrics. Um, so people are going through their experience, like through the music and the vibration of the music. And they're laying comfortably. Typically, people just lay down and they just go through their experience. Um, we don't encourage blindfolds, but it's totally like your decision. A lot of the documentaries are showing clinical settings with blindfolds. We're doing it outdoors as well. So we're connecting with nature. Yeah. So Ooh, we're cool. so you get to either close your eyes and go more inwards or you get to open your eyes and feel the connection that you will feel in the medicine with the nature, which is ultimately what the medicine is meant to do is reconnect us with nature so mm. you got me there i'm like cool <laughs> sign me up sign me up so so with all that you know i think the other biggest thing that folks are always wondering about is safety right and and like you had said you you guys screen for the pre you know for pre-existing conditions and contraindications should someone have 
let's say a psychotic break and they weren't sure that that was like they had no idea that that might show up or things things show up what what do you guys have in place to help folks move through those kind of things well i can say in all the years i've been doing this i've never seen anyone have a psychotic break i think the screening helps with that oftentimes people who are having a psychotic experience with a medicine is because they weren't prepared properly for it, that experience. Um, so there's also a five week preparatory course mm-hmm. that people do online, which is meditation, breath work, and some, some journaling exercises just to really start to get you to start to show up for yourself. So, so yeah, so I haven't seen anybody have a psychotic break um, because there is such a uh, good screening. However, if somebody went into that state, uh, obviously, like, I mean, I, I was a paramedic, so I would know what to do. Um, and it, a lot of like, if it's a, like, say a bad trip, let's say like, that's what it feels like. If it, if it like this psychotic break is a bad trip, then we're changing the setting. We're changing the music. You know, those are really important things, just changing your environment. And then I'll do some coaching with people to just kind of bring them back and just to realize that this is a temporary experience and you're going to be out of the medicine soon. We can also bring you out of the medicine. So there are some some ways of bringing people out of the medicine. So, so those, are, those are kind of protocols we have in place for those types of situations if they were to happen. You know, I think screening is everything, right? And, yeah. and, and having someone there that, you know, obviously, because I saw the history of being a paramedic, I'm like, okay, if anything really, you know, serious went down, you at least know what to do and, and get people the proper care. But also not only that, like having, having an eyeball on, on the folks, right. As they're going through it and being able to, to talk them through and help them. I mean, so huge, so huge. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we haven't talked about is your book. Okay. And, and this is. It's a very bold, you know, title for the book, Nude. And saying good, so it's a, it's nude, saying goodbye to who you thought you were and stepping into who you are, correct? That's a delicate yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the book and is, you know, inspiration, obviously your story, but also, yeah, give us a little bit of background about the book too. Yeah, so the book is my personal um transformation in my own life because I went from somebody who was insecure who you know believed in Cinderella stories who believed that life owed me something and was always looking for that thing and that when challenges would come in I'd be like what did I do wrong you know like I was existing in that state and program my program was that and so what I learned as I went through my life is that every single experience that feels difficult or challenging, because those are also our um, perspective on them, because really like what is bad and what is good. I mean, that's personal, right? So, um, but challenges actually are what help us to breed our own wisdom. They're what help us to grow. They're what help us to be redirected. And so depending on where you are in your spiritual path, and this was kind of my my kind of intro to spirituality, I started to realize that there was patterns happening in my life. And I'm like, this is really interesting. Like what is happening in my life? And so the book is actually a prescriptive memoir. So it's my story, but it, it's also a guide for people to help access the understanding and wisdom of their own story and understanding like what, why did these things happen to me? What it, like if I did, if that breakup didn't happen, then I wouldn't be here. Or like just taking like this kind of bird's eye view of your life and and seeing, oh look, it, like I kept attracting these types of relationships into my life until I did this, and then when I did this, everything shifted, and then I met the like man of my dreams, or you know. So it's it's just really this way of navigating your own life, so that when challenges do come into play, like you're like, okay, what are you trying to teach me? You know, like just you start to become kind of like the student as opposed to the victim. And so I was the victim in my life for so long. And then I was like, wait a second, there's so much wisdom here. There's so much, so many gifts that came from those horrible experiences that we have to go through. And I am so grateful for every single, you know, experience that I've been through. You know, the book talks about my experience in Haiti um, during the 
the earthquakes in 2010, I was there as a humanitarian and just like having these contrasts of what it's like in, in a place where like it's mass chaos and poverty and, and then coming back to working as a paramedic in like a developed country and just how much we take for granted and like all of the wisdom and insights from those experiences. And like, and a lot of the stories that are about my love life and, you know, the horrible things or the positive things in the end that happened. And, um, you know, it's very raw. There's a lot of controversial issues in there as well. Controversial decisions, we all have them. And I'm very honest. And so, so that was my book. And um, the feedback's been really great, though, because I was really fearful to release it because of the controversy in it. But everybody's supportive. And I feel like I feel like a lot of women can really relate to my story. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the feedback I've gotten on it. Oh, I, I don't doubt it. I mean, we, <laughs> we as women, we're, we're kind of how do I say it? It's almost like brainwashed since early, you know, with the the Disney Cinderella stories, right? And and Hallmark, um, you know, channel. It's it's rough. It's rough to to really you know think of things in terms of a lesson versus why not me? Why yeah. you know why me and why not me and the whole victimhood? I mean, it's very huge. And uh, yeah, it's yeah. it's beautiful to be able to share your story and and help others because I have no doubt that sharing the story is definitely going to inspire someone to take some action here. Now, we have to talk about, you know, we've talked about the ins and outs, but we haven't talked about the big picture of the Arcadia Healing Sanctum. So tell us a little bit about how folks can find you guys. Tell us a little bit about more details that maybe they need to know in terms of website and details and things of that nature. Yeah. So, um, so we are, we have been running retreats in Canada. Um, we're just trialing it here. We were here last summer. We're here again, uh, this summer. Um, it's, it's still on the fence if we're going to continue, but Mexico retreats are always amazing. I mean, who doesn't want to go to Mexico and it's so beautiful. The culture is amazing. And so usually our, our retreats, um, we're hosting them in the jungle in like, a in a very private location, like a gated like a gated area with a pool. And um, we have a chef that we work with. He's amazing, um, very, um, he has his own story and journey to his own healing and food was his, his healing. And then uh, we have, we work with like amazing facilitators. We have incredible um, sound healers. They're like a family that they make their own instruments. And it's almost like, again, like you're going to a symphony. It's really incredible. And so, and everybody who's part of Arcadia is really passionate about what they're doing. And so we have like a yoga instructor and she just like absolutely loves teaching yoga and helping people heal. And the chef is so passionate about his food and like he does like a presentation. And then the sound healers are like sharing their medicine. And so we all bring our own gifts to the, to the experience. And every single person there has been doing their own healing work, which is really important as well. I mean, it's hard to know that when you're going into a place to heal, but sometimes if we're not doing our own work, we can project onto others. So, you know, so that's important too. So that's been, that's been kind of like this beautiful, like, I feel like when I started Arcadia, I just attracted in the right people to work with me. And it's, it's really flowed from there. So it felt aligned. Um, so you can find more information about the retreats on arcadiahealing.ca. And you can either book in for a consult and we'll just chat and see if you, you know, if you're the right fit for a retreat or if it's even the right thing for you to, to begin with. Um, sometimes there's other things you can do to get prepared for it. And then, um, and then there's an application on there as well. And yeah, you'll see photos of our retreats and all the information and the videos that you mentioned. So wonderful stuff. I mean, you definitely got me thinking, Hmm, how could I get <laughs> myself down there? Um, you know, it's, it's so important to ensure that the people that you're working with are on their own journey. You know, none of us are perfect. We're all, it's a progression, right? And I think it's hugely important to make sure that whoever you decide to work with, uh, that ha someone has done the own work themselves, because it's one of the things that I realized as, as a doctor and an acupuncturist that 
I needed more work. And Mm -hmm. you show up and get a better experience when when you've seen someone that's been doing their own work. So that's very true. Yeah, no, for sure. I feel like, you know, you can't, you don't really know if someone's doing their work, but I think you can energetically feel, like you said, like you can almost feel it intuitively. Like you just, you can tell they're grounded or they're not. Like there's, there is a different energy that comes with somebody that has been doing their own healing work. For sure. Gosh, what what great stuff. I'm looking forward to to diving in a little bit more with you and seeing, you know, what we can do for for a lot of my clients. So thank you so much, Tara, for coming on. I sincerely appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.